Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this very unusual story slam. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be Olin, it wouldn't be Expo without it. So we're so happy to be here and to be able to deliver it to you in this very unusual format. I think the most unusual piece of it is that we aren't feeling like we're all there together. So you're all off in your own spaces. Please laugh at your screen, cry, because we won't see you. Um, but please, um, you know, be here fully with us. We're so happy to have you here. Um, let's say who we are, <laughs> in oh. case someone doesn't know Imagine us. that. So, and anyone who doesn't know me, I'm John. <laughs> I'm a psychology professor here, and I've been working with Jillian and the students on the Story Slam all year. And John apparently forgot to shave, but you look fantastic. I know. I'm Jillian Epstein. Oh, yeah. I'm the writing initiative specialist here. Um, should we go? Get going? Let's do it. Okay. Go for it, Jillian. Um, let's do it. Okay. So when I think about uh, why we tell stories and what stories mean. Uh, the best way I know to do that is to tell you a story myself. So that's what I'm gonna do, if that's all right with you. Um, I'm gonna imagine that you said, yes, it was. So uh, my partner is Russian and his family is from Russia and uh, they all speak Russian in Russia. It's interesting that way. And so when we Skype with his 92 year old dad every week, his dad speaks exclusively in Russian and uh, I do not. I only speak two words in Russian. I can say hello and I can say goodbye. So uh, when we're on the Skype call, I don't have much to contribute. And um, uh, so that went on for a little while. And after a bit, I got the lucky chance to go to Russia and stay for a week with my partner's father. And I thought, okay, this is it. I'm gonna learn some Russian. Um, I'm gonna combine sort of the intense pressure of knowing only two words in Russian, hello and goodbye, uh, with the intense need to learn many more words in Russian and they'll somehow collide uh, and I'll become a language learning genius. Uh, sadly, that plan did not come to pass. It happened that over the course of the week, I still knew two words in Russian, hello and goodbye. Uh, and then I added exactly one additional word to my repertoire, and it was arbus, which means watermelon. Uh, may I suggest that if you're only going to learn three words in a language, uh, that watermelon not be one of them, it's not particularly useful. So I went home, I kind of hit bottom, and I said, okay, that's it, I'm gonna learn Russian. Uh, I downloaded an app, I went hard for a few weeks, maybe even six weeks learning Russian. And Russian is a difficult language to learn. Uh, I know this not just because I found it difficult, but because the app actually spent all of lesson two trying to teach us how to say Russian is a difficult language to learn. I'd say it for you now in Russian, uh, but it was difficult to learn. See what I did there, yeah. Uh, so after a few weeks, I said, you know what, I'm ready for prime time. Let's call your 92 year old dad on Skype and I'm going to talk to him in Russian. So we did. Uh, I said, hello. He said, hello. I asked him his name, which was weird because uh, I've known him for years, but he was very sweet about it. He told me his name. I told him how I was doing. And that took all of, I would say, about 45 seconds. And then I had nothing. Uh, there was a long awkward silence, sort of like this, but longer uh, and more awkward. And I said to myself during that silence, I will be damned if I say watermelon right now. Uh, so I didn't, I went deep in my subconscious and I said, okay, I gotta see what Russian sentences are left in the subconscious. And sadly, after six weeks or so of learning Russian, there were only three sentences remaining. Uh, one of them was from the unit where we learned about asking about people's jobs. That seemed weird um, for asking my partner's 92 year old dad. Uh, and the other two sentences were from the unit where we pretended we were in a restaurant and we would order stuff. None of that seemed ideal, but that's what I had. So the first sentence I could have asked my partner's 92 year old dad on Skype was this. Yes, for Dean President. Translation, Mr. President, what is your job? Uh, this wasn't great. I wasn't speaking with a president. And if you are speaking with a president, I feel like 
it's not going to be great to ask them what their job is what their jobs being president so i didn't go with that uh option two was from the restaurant unit and i could have said ya budu greczki salat translation i want a greek salad this felt rude uh i wasn't talking to a waiter and i had no idea if my partner's dad had the cucumbers and the feta cheese on hand it was it was a whole problematic place to go uh, so that left me with one final sentence to say which was in fact what i did say to my partner's 92 year old dad uh, so i said to him uvas jest vodka and turns out this was a slam dunk i had asked him do you have any vodka and yes Yes, he did. Uh, he lit up, he started running around his small apartment like a 92 year old gazelle. Uh, and he was taking out mason jars filled with vodka and they were squirreled away in strange places like the bookcase and the piano bench. And he was toasting our health on Skype and we weren't there, so he had to drink our part too. Um, so he was happy. Um, and it seemed that my Russian actually started sounding a lot better to him once he was drunk. So hooray, a happy ending for all. And when I told this story at Candidates Weekend at Olin in February, it seemed like this story was also about how easy it is to take uh, self-expression for granted and how easy it is to have so many words at our fingertips to communicate with ourselves and with others, uh, far beyond the very limited borders of Greek salads and watermelons. Uh, and sure, my story's still about that, but now in our dramatically altered landscape of time and place, I really can't get past uh, all the Skype calls at the, on the computer screens at the heart of my story. I mean, I literally can't get past the computer screen at the heart of my story. Hey, Luke. Um, let's face it, I'm stuck in a weird rectangle right now, trying to talk to an invisible audience and tell them stories. And all I can see uh, is my giant face. It's, it's tricky. Um, so right now, in this place and time, my story very much feels like it's about how easy it was in February and all the months prior to take for granted that we would be able to communicate and connect in person. But I hope my story is also about that regardless of what's standing in our way, be it a language barrier, an ocean, a virus, a computer screen, or yes, an admittedly tricky webinar format that will persevere and find a way to connect anyway. And it warms my heart, that's kind of my neck, but you get the idea. It warms my heart that we have five incredible, brave, fabulous, full and student storytellers here for you today, ready to connect with you no matter what. We hope you enjoy their stories. Spasiba. All right, I'm back. Thank you so much, Jillian. Um, so every year we've done these story slams. Jillian and I divide up the, the welcome section in this same way. Um, she tells a story beautifully. Um, and then I do my spiel about what stories do for us as people. Um, so I know many of you have heard the gist of that story before, since it's been the central question of my research for the last 20 years, and I can't stop talking about it. Um, but I actually have something a little different to say today. So Jillian told basically that same story back at our annual Candidates Weekend Story Slams in February, as she said. Um, and like Jillian, I'm also sort of struck by the way it's the same, and yet it's also changed. So the, the plot is the same, Jillian learning to speak Russian so she can chat with her partner's dad. Um, but as she said so nicely, the, the meaning has really shifted. Right back in February, it was more about not taking our ability to communicate with each other for granted, and it still contains that meaning. But now it's also about this working hard at making a connection across great distances. And isn't that what we're all trying to do these days? So I actually think Jillian's story is a great example of something that happens to all of us all of the time, though most of us are not nearly as witty and articulate as Jillian. Um, so the raw data of our life experiences are what they are, but the present acts like a lens for filtering all of that raw data into something much more magical and something more important, meaning. So in my field, we say that one of the primary reasons we tell stories about our lives is what's called diachronic integration. 
feeling like we are the same person over time. So in order to produce meaning, our life stories weave together the, the reconstructed past, the perceived present, and the imagined future into a coherent through line that, that guides our behavior and, and supports our mental health. And I don't know about you, but I've been feeling much less diachronically integrated than usual these days. So stories are the, the amazingly efficient and effective tool for making sense of our lives that we've evolved as a species, but they need all three parts of our temporal selves to work, the past, the present, and the future. So at this moment in our history, when the future feels so uncertain, it actually becomes harder to make sense of our lives. But here's the thing, the future is actually always a speculative fiction. We're just much more aware of that uncertainty now than we usually are. And I think it's also important to remember that the past is also a reconstruction, not an objective report. So for me, it's actually vital that we double down on storytelling at this moment in our history. The work is harder, but there's no more important work to do. We, we have to be able to imagine the story of how our shared past could lead to a whole variety of possible futures before we can take action to commit to any one of them. So, it seems fitting to me that, that we bring the academic year to an end with, with the beautiful, moving, brave stories that these five students have worked on. Um, so Jillian and I asked the students to, to revisit their stories from, from the winter um, to bring them into the present. And what struck me about that revision process, I think actually offers a lesson for all of us. It was really easy. <laughs> Once you've done the hard work of reflection, to consolidate the meaning of some moment in your life, it becomes a tool that you can pull out and use in almost any situation. So these student storytellers are role models for us in so many ways, but now I'd like for us to look to them for inspiration about the power of a well-crafted story in the face of huge upheaval. I hope we can all work on that project together. All right. Okay, thank, thank you, John. Um, so our first storyteller, is up. Yes, I'm back. Hooray. Um, so thank you, John. Our first storyteller is up, and we're going to have the wonderful Gretchen Rice with Room for Error. Hello. I'm very excited to be telling a story to a bunch of invisible people. Um, okay, I have an idea. Picture this, a glass bottle coffee table. I'd been thinking about it for about for weeks now and was finally ready to propose the idea to dad. What if we took a bunch of glass bottle bottoms, glued them side by side and organized them into a tabletop? I knew from the start it would be a gift for my brother and his girlfriend, a sort of housewarming gift. They have a bunch of windows and I kept imagining how beautiful a glass table would be with all that light shining through, reflecting greens and blues and browns on the ground. I had gone through five sketches already. It would be a round table. Or actually maybe a rectangle. Well, would a triangle work? No, too pointy. Imagine bumping into that. It would be a rectangle, but a big rectangle, probably six bottles by 10 bottles, and with a four inch homemade wooden frame and long legs that would be stained dark. I pictured clean lines, a mix of modern and rustic, sort of a farmhouse minimalist vibe, which probably isn't a thing, but it could be. Maybe I was thinking so much about this because I was tired of the gray tyranny of CAD, adjusting ratios, finding exact measurements, including its fastener, determining optimal material for each component, estimating force load on the entire object, doing motion tests, meshing gears, and then once that's all finally done, following that CAD plan to a T, even if you get much better ideas once you actually start building. Because if you want to change anything, you have to wade through the murky sea of CAD and change whatever component is wrong. And then change every other thing that depends on that component, which might be everything. Have I mentioned that I want to make a table out of glass bottles? Because I want to be spontaneous. 
like on Making It, a show I binge watched this summer where crafters come together, are given a challenge and just make it. One project they did was a quilt that could be made out of anything. They made quilts from felt, embroidery hoops, and even one out of wood. I figure if someone can make a wooden quilt in front of the world on television, I can make a glass bottle table in my dad's garage. I was going to finally have fun again. I was excited to get started with my dad and work from just an idea. As I dug through the box of bottle bottoms in the garage, I realized there were only so many bottles that were smooth enough to use. The rest were like a monster's teeth, but I was determined. I set out the bottles, organizing them by color and meticulously moving them around. Like a puzzle I was trying to force together without a reference image except the fantasy in my mind. After a while of hopelessly trying to make the bottles fit together, my lurking dad said, follow me, and led me to the basement where he handed me a box wrapped in tape. I opened it to find a treasure chest of vibrant, colorful, carefully cut, shiny, sparkling pieces of glass. It was just like my dad to have exactly the right yard sale drunk hidden away in the basement. But I didn't want his treasure. I wanted things to go according to my plan, but I begrudgingly carried the box back to the garage anyway, figuring I would give the bottles a break just to humor my dad. We had bought an octagonal piece of glass earlier that week to play around with supporting the bottles. So we began picking out the translucent pieces of glass and carefully piecing them together on the octagon. Admittedly, the glass was beautiful. Not only were there greens, blues, and browns, there were also reds, purples, teals, and yellows. And the broken shapes were much more interesting and varied than the uniformly circular bottle bottoms. No longer was I creating a precise symmetrical table. I was creating a jumble of color. I carefully picked and placed each shard of glass. They seemed to talk to each other and slide into positions of close connection. And yet the connection wasn't quite close enough. There were gaps between the shards. If I could have planned it, each piece would have been designed to precisely tessellate and fully cover the surface, leaving no space for error. But I was tired of meticulous planning, even the fantasy plans in my head, and insisting on perfect alignment would have hidden the uniqueness of each shape and the brilliance of each color. So the table didn't work out my way, and it definitely didn't work out Cad's way. It was better, smaller than anticipated, more of a side table than a coffee table, held together with a lot of super glue and an even bigger amount of letting go. It had character and style and it lit up in my brother's apartment, which was perfect. Things feel a lot less perfect now, sent home months early from my final year at Olin and looking into a very uncertain future. I hope that like my table, everything will work out, but it's hard to be sure when I haven't glued the pieces together yet. Oh, thank you, Gretchen. That was wonderful. Um, we'll give a little, a little applause like this for Gretchen. Um, okay, so our next story is called Manhunt Beatdown by Jamie Santiago. Hello. Um, Manhunt Beatdown is quite possibly the most dangerous game I have ever played on an elementary school playground, but also quite possibly one of the most fun. My memory of the game is foggy, but that might just come with the territory. I remember standing on the playground. Uh, I was maybe 13 years old. It was a pretty gray day and a storm was definitely about to start. And not in the way you think. Uh, me and a pretty random lineup of 13 to 18 year olds from the neighborhood were huddled. And Oso, which was his name because he looked like a bear, was explaining the rules. He told us how the game was basically regular manhunt where one person starts by being it and everyone else can choose to either run away or hide or both, but anyone who gets caught also becomes it. And the game continues until there's no one left to tag. But in Manhunt Beatdown, there's an extra detail, which is that when you get tagged, everyone who's it can punch or beat you to their heart's content for 30 seconds. Now, thinking back, the appeal of the game was fairly evident, just like the appeal of all the other games you played back then, like pinecone tag, football, and cage fights. All of these games are very physical, very violent, and very 
cathartic. Uh, a lot of kids in the apartment complex where I lived had a lot of emotions and feelings they needed to work through. And this was their way to work through it, whether it was protecting their mother from their stepfather's aggression, living in a world where everyone made it clear that they were useless, or some other shitstorm they had constantly wreaking havoc in the back of their mind. We all had stuff to deal with. We all have stuff to deal with. We all had an unspoken agreement to be each other's stress balls. One day, someone would chuck a pine cone at your head or tackle you into the back of a truck or slam your head against a wall, and regardless, you'd wake up the next morning, knock on their door, and everything would be cool. But to be clear, you never want to be tackled into the back of a truck. If it happens, you let it go, but don't just let it happen. That was the sentiment I felt as I watched six people beat down on the unfortunate soul who was just tagged. As I watched this kid getting consensually jumped by his friends, fully realizing that a worse fate was laid in store for me, I felt excited and practically dared for them to come to me. Back then, I wasn't six foot three and 250 pounds, and I was way quicker on my feet. I ran around and dodged reaching hands for as long as I could. I wasn't simply running away from a beating. I was showcasing my physical prowess and was enjoying that they were struggling to get me. And yeah, some of you might have realized that the longer I prolonged getting caught, the worse the beating, but that didn't matter. It was negligible. The beating was nothing compared to the ones that would take place outside the game. And I was going to get beat down at some point anyway. I might as well make something out of it. Just like how Oso got respect because of his size and strength, I wanted respect because of my agility. And being a punching bag for 30 seconds was worth the respect I get for making it difficult for them to catch me. I was the last one tagged. I don't remember how I got tagged, possibly because of what was to follow, but I do remember laying on my back as a few members of the group held my limbs. The rest of the group embraced me with a warm fury of fists landing all over my torso. Luckily, there were no cheap shots, but nonetheless, it was more of an unpleasant experience than otherwise. These games were good for us. They were a structured way to uncork the bottle of frustration we all had festering. And when those games weren't played, I remember fights way more dangerous and filled with much more hate. The games were good, and I look back on them fondly. Through these games, all the pain and stress of our lives was dumped into a safe space, and we got the opportunity to let go. And they aren't games I need to play anymore. Everything that made me that angry has been resolved to some degree. Well, actually, maybe resolved isn't the right word. Uh, everything is still there, but the rest of me has grown around it, kind of like this kid I knew who fell on the blacktop in elementary school and got a rock in his hand but didn't want to get it taken out, so his hand just kind of healed around it. At first, when you looked at his hand, you could see the gash with the rock wedged in his skin. But as time passed, the rock became less and less visible as his skin grew around it, and until it got to the point where, unless he told you the rock was there, you wouldn't even know it was there. I haven't spoken to anyone from the apartment complex in maybe five years. It was pretty common for people to come and go with little warning. You'd hang out with someone one day and never see them again. Sadly, I was no different. Having had to move out with short notice, I wasn't able to say goodbye. And since then, it's been pretty difficult to remember the rock was there. Besides the occasional Instagram post proving also exists. I have zero evidence that everything I remember happened, happened. So I guess I'm telling you this to sort of reconfirm that these events actually took place. Because if you all know they did, then that would be a bit more comforting. If I tell you it's there, then I'll be more confident it's true. My abrupt departure from Olin feels very different from when I disappeared from the apartment complex. Instead of being blindsided, this time I had a week or two to see it coming. My disappearance from the complex marked an end, but my departure from Olin is simply a middle. The plot continues, just in a different location. And although this set change feels uncomfortable, it won't get under my skin.
Thank you, Jamie. That was fantastic. Uh, next up, we have Ever Gonzalez with A Bumpy Ride. Frustration. That's what I was feeling when I came back to Ole in my junior year. I just didn't see the point in the work anymore. I was not excited, which was really a shame because it seemed like everyone else was excited. There was a special loneliness in not sharing that excitement with everyone else. So I take a go bike and I start writing because I need an outlet. It doesn't matter much where I'm going. I just need some time not dealing with it. As I try shifting gears, I realize this bike is broken as all heck. It has one speed, slow, and the front brake only provides an illusion of safety. I can't get anywhere on this piece of garbage. All right, fine, bike. If I'm not getting off campus, I'm at least getting to Parcel B, the mini forest on Olin's campus. Today, I want to see just how much this bike can handle. And there's nothing like mud and slippery slopes and puddles and uneven ground and tree roots for seeing what a bike can handle. So as I soar through dirt trails at a whopping five miles per hour, I see an opportunity. A long, shallow downward slope lies ahead of me. Mud coats the sides of an uneven trail with tall brush splitting it through the middle. It's perfect. I max out the bike speed, moving much faster than I could ever hope with this broken gearing system on flat ground. My pedaling loses its significance as the back wheel spins faster than my feet can keep up with. I ride right over roots, over potholes, over whatever I can. My front tire slips as I slide around a sharp right, and the momentum tries to pull me off the bike. I rustle the steering bar to maintain control. In this moment, I am not worried about some project or problem set or job interview. Because in the next moment, I could be that person who flew off a broken go bike, speeding down a shallow slope, right into a thorn bush in Parcel B. And I don't want that to be me. What matters in this moment is that I don't fall, period. No scheduling, no due dates, no worrying, no nothing, just don't fall. It's a high risk moment in a low risk forest. Beyond the forest, the rest of Olin waited in Parcel A. And lately, Parcel A was feeling a lot more tame. It's not like Olin has no risk associated with it. I need to pass my classes and complete my projects and make some friends and eventually leave and find a job. That's setting me up for the rest of my life. And what's a bigger adrenaline rush than thinking about how this one particular project could affect the rest of your life? But Somehow, my work feels pretty low risk anyway. There's no real penalty to turning in that problem set late. I'll just do it later. Uh, nothing bad really happens if my project fails. I'm graded on what I learned. At least if I fall off the bike, I'll feel the impact. But schoolwork at Olin isn't about trying not to get hurt. It's much more about feeling motivated and excited to do the work, which is a problem I'm having. Sure. I can work on a team to make a sculpture of a giant squid attacking a submarine as a scuba tries to escape by kicking the squid away. The result of countless hours of cam design and assembly in SolidWorks, printing a cam, punching holes, drilling holes, riveting pieces together, jamming pins through rods, and redesigning parts that don't fit. But none of those skills feel new and risky anymore. Whereas anyone could take a look at the weird cookie monster robot that I programmed my first year at Olin and see that I didn't know what I was doing. Installing Ubuntu for some reason, um, learning Python, and that it has nothing to do with snakes, and tweaking facial recognition software, and what's this index error nonsense I keep seeing? I was bushwhacking through unknown territory, and even if I was lost, it felt like it was where I wanted to be. And that's the kind of ride I want to have in Parcel A but it's hard to go on the less traveled roads when there's so many required paths that I have to take. The minute I get the chance, I'm finding the shittiest, bumpiest, riskiest, most exciting path that I can, and it's gonna feel great. So with everything that's happened, I guess now this is where I should say, you don't know what you have until you lose it. 
but that's not really what I'm feeling. I'm not going to suddenly romanticize my normal life at Olin, but I'm also not afraid of feeling trapped when I return, because I have more confidence that when I finally get back on that bike, I'll know where to take it. All right, thank you, Ever. That's for... All right, our next story is called Heart by Jerry Goss. Um, hi. So this whole story slam thing is like a really big deal for me. It's an opportunity for me to do what I do best, talk and not just about anything, but talk about myself and my life and my experiences and all the things I love and hate. Well, I don't really hate things. It's too much negative energy. So I grew up with my single mom in the projects. Things weren't great. I ran away and was followed by the police like four times. My brother was involved with gang violence and was shot and killed for advocating against it. My sister died in a house fire with her first and only son, also the first and only baby I have ever held, leaving me as the last of my mother's children. I moved in with my dad and he disappeared frequently, so I bathed, fed, and took care of my ailing grandma, while I simultaneously had to sneak out at night to find a computer and internet to do homework. Then I got thrown into foster care and I had to deal with a new family upon entering high school. And somewhere in the middle of all that, my heart broke. Yep, my heart literally broke and not in the, oh no, my life is over, I can't go on anymore kind of way. It was definitely more of the, my heart needs to be surgically removed from my body and I cannot live without a fucking heart in my chest. So naturally, I went into a coma. I had idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, which translates to heart muscle disease of unknown origins. And I woke up on my third kind of artificial heart. And that was not fun. A month long coma leaves the body very weak and recovery was actually pretty manageable in the sense that I didn't like it, but I couldn't really complain too much given that my uh, vocal cords had calloused over, thus making speech impossible. So the entire time I was in the hospital, I was just kind of chilling the whole time. I don't know how much you can change at 11 years old, but I feel like I changed in more ways than just having my heart carved out of my chest cavity. One of the big things was not being able to get scared anymore. So it's kind of weird. The nervous system doesn't really recover from things like a complete extraction. So when people would try to scare me, I wouldn't respond at all or I would have a delayed response. I didn't jump or scream. My face didn't really change expressions or anything. And the heart doesn't skip a beat. The most I could do was raise an eyebrow. And if you can't tell, my eyebrows don't really move that much. But <laughs> this is also why I suck at doing athletic shit. So your body recognizes it's under distress and then it sends a signal to your heart so that it accelerates to sustain the body. But for me, that signal is severely delayed. So I have to stretch or do jumping jacks before I run or something just to increase the pulse just a wee bit or else I'll be insanely exhausted when the heart finally catches on to the fact that my body and my brain needs more blood and more oxygen for me to remain conscious. Another big thing was not really getting mad anymore. So my dad and I didn't really get along. I would get mad and I would cry and then my heart would ache. Hearts take a really long time to heal. It was a whole ordeal or whatever, but I punched my TV, I shattered it. This was middle school, by the way. I was very angry. And that's, that's when I finally realized it, that I don't need to feel. None of it needs to hurt. I looked in the mirror. I didn't like the look of anger on my face. And I failed to see how it was helping me. Then this sense of calmness and euphoria washed over me. After that, I couldn't do anything but smile when my dad would get mad at me. Definitely didn't help the situation. But time proceeds and this rationality kind of permeated into everything. And I could only feel when I could justify the feeling. I thought I became a lot happier and I really did in some ways. 
I feel like it's really cool because it's allowed me to take a stoic and positive outlook walking through harder parts of my life. But at the same time, it makes me feel weak and inexperienced. I feel like I'm lacking an entire ocean of emotional depth. I'm not a robot. My heart got extracted. Give me a break. But I just don't feel as much. And I really, really wish I did. I didn't get to live my so far relatively short life with the uh, full spectrum of emotions, which really develops a person. I feel like I've missed an opportunity to feel because I had to adapt to my, as the social workers call it, hard life experiences. And I feel like I've literally lost a big piece of myself because of the transplant. Coupled by the fact that surgeons refused to let me keep my heart in a jar. Fucking asshole. But I'm not going to transplant <laughs> uh, an ending on this story, at least not a happy one. This relationship between my heart and I is a work in progress. And at least I'm starting to call it mine. And as of right now, my heart and I are living on Olin's deserted campus. And the isolation from the pandemic has really reminded me that even though it's uncomfortable, it's really difficult to be isolated, it can be really restorative. Now that I'm suddenly alone again, I can reflect, reconnect to, and feel new oceans of feelings I otherwise wouldn't pay attention to. I can't speak to the future for my heart and I, but right now, we're vibing. Thank you, Jerry. And we have up last but not least for you, the wonderful Meg Koo with Secret Love. I hope you're hungry. So every morning in the Olin Dining Hall, I would get the same exact thing for breakfast. Eggs and bacon on a bed of white rice, all covered in ketchup. Overall, the meal was okay, although the bacon was difficult to cut with a fork and spoon, my utensils of choice. If I had it my way, though, I would have lost the bacon. Because what I really wanted with my eggs and rice and ketchup was spam. For those of you who are unfamiliar, spam is a blend of pork and, according to the label, mechanically separated chicken. Hmm. When I peel back the lid of a Spam can, I'm greeted by pale pink meat and the aroma that comes with it, a vague scent of ham and notes of cat food. But, per but perhaps Spam's greatest feature is the sound it makes when it is extracted from the can. My personal technique is to flip the can completely upside down and shake it until the meat releases, creating a low-pitched slurping sound, sort of like <sighs> as it frees from the can's walls. Now, I know what you're thinking, and trust me, I've already heard it. I know that when you think of spam, you throw up a little inside. Or sometimes you don't hide it, like when you make fake retching noises to my face when I use the words spam and yummy in the same sentence. And I know better than to pop open a can of spam around others. This past summer, I worked as an intern out in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I shared my apartment with an intern who happened to be let's just say, vegan. I can vividly remember the first and only time I opened Spam in our apartment kitchen. She walked in to see me fighting a pink block of mystery meat as I was trying to shake it out of the oblong can. Instead of running away, she sat at the kitchen counter, her eyes not straying away from the Spam. I just want to watch. She said, as if I was a participant in a particularly lurid fear factor challenge. And it's not just the vegans who seem worried about spam. My immunology classmates weren't huge fans either. I know this because my immunology professor mentioned to the class that a previous student had written their final research paper on whether spam causes cancer. The class immediately burst into laughter, punctuated with comments like, spam is so gross, and ew, and I wouldn't be surprised if it does. I didn't laugh with them. 
part of me wanted to shout, actually, spam is really tasty, while the rest of me wondered if I was going to get cancer, seeing as my body composition is at least 5% spam. But most of all, I was embarrassed. Embarrassed that I enjoyed something that made so many of my peers react in disgust. So I hid behind my laptop, tuning out the spam shaming conversation going on around me by reading emails I already read and color coding my schedule by class and activity, which looks really nice. But I feel like such a coward keeping my love of spam a secret. I recently decided to ask my family how the spam mania began. I thought about asking my dad at breakfast, but he was quite occupied with his latest find from the grocery store. Spam spread. It looked like someone in R&D had taken a can of spam, pureed it in the blender for a minute, and then repackaged it. Try it, my dad insisted at breakfast. If you eat it with your pancakes, it's just like spam and bread. My verdict? Spam reminds other people of cat food. Spam spread reminds me of cat food. After breakfast, I asked my mom about when she started eating Spam and why. Without missing a beat, she remarked, Spam is a luxury because it's imported from the US. You know that Americans colonized the Philippines, right? To which I nodded. But that's not why we like Spam. We like it because it's good with rice. My parents tried extremely hard to make sure their first generation daughter fit in. They didn't speak Tagalog, the Filipino language, around me when I was younger because a study had come out saying that a child learning multiple languages would struggle to learn in school. That study has long since been disproved, but I barely understand the language. Spoons also became an issue. Like most Filipinos, I had learned how to eat almost every meal with a fork in one hand and a spoon in the other, using the edge of the spoon as a knife if need be but that was not allowed during our American dinner evenings. No one gets any spoons tonight, mom would say authoritatively. This quickly became a problem when we had to face the pile of peas on our plates. After playing a long game of tag, chasing down peas with our forks, the peas were winning. My mom gave up and passed out spoons so we could eat in peace. None of us really caught onto the fork and knife lifestyle. We know how they work. We're just not using them. Whenever I find my way back to the Olin dining hall, I'm not reaching for a knife. They're so blunt, they're worse than the spoons anyway. And I will still get the same meal for breakfast. But I know I'll be thinking about Spam almost every morning and how it would taste so much better with my eggs and rice than the mass-produced bacon. And I guess I could bring a can of Spam or two to campus, but I stand up for enough things already. I have a floor-length winter coat. All of my socks have either Star Wars characters or food like ramen or sushi or bubble tea on them. Everything hooked onto my backpack is super fluffy, like my fluffy bunny and my fluffy owl and my fluffy Pokemon. The things I stand out for are cute. They're whimsical. And at Olin, spam doesn't fit my profile. To others, spam seems more gross than cute. And I'm not ready to stand out that way. But Spam understands. It's been waiting for me at home. And we're back together for now. Yay, thank you so much. <laughs> Fantastic, so storytellers all come join us. Thank you all so thank much you, for joining Keep us for this. Um, yeah, so we just wanted to Thanks remind everyone that at 1 p.m. we hear from President Rick Miller. Yeah, sure. Um, so we just want to remind everyone that at 1 p.m. we'll hear from President Rick Miller and the OCO. But in the meantime, feel free to stretch your legs and grab a snack or just hang out here and mingle in the chat. And then after we hear from OCO, we invite you to go see the amazing things the Olin community has to share. So please check out the Airtable Gallery to see where and when to go. Thanks so much, everyone. We miss seeing you. Thank you, Colin.
Hello, Rick. I see you there. They've unmuted me. Hello, it's Diana. Um, but I don't think they've made me go live yet. Let's see if I can start my video. Can you hear me now? I hear you perfectly. Uh, but good. I think during your talk, you know, they keep everyone blacked out pretty much. Yeah, that's For, probably. Yeah. Um, no and distractions. Also, excuse, me, excuse me, panelists, just to let you know that your audio, uh, we are screen sharing a slide, but your audio is live. Okay, good. Oh, thank you. Well, anyway, Rick, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Diana. I'm looking forward to the time when we can get together in person again. Boy, so am I. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go silent now so that we can get prepared.
Hey, Evan, your sound is having problem. How about Amazing. is that fixed? Yes. Now? Okay. Sorry about that. Again, welcome everybody to Expo. It's great to have you all here. Uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, definitely go back to Alessandra's email. The last link in there has a link to the Expo brochure that has all of the info for today's event. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand things off to President Rick Miller, who'd like to say a few words of welcome to everybody. Good. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, <clears throat> let me add my welcome to Olin's first virtual expo. Um, this is really quite a unique event, uh, celebrating achievement and learning across all members of the Olin campus community. In spite of the physical distancing, uh, that we have to observe today, we're able to celebrate anyway because of the availability of Zoom technology and because of the vision and the hard work of our industrious community, especially Professor Alessandro Ferzocco. So today's expo marks yet another Olin first, but for me personally, it also marks an Olin last. My last expo as president of Olin. Uh, I can't help but reflect back a little on the origin of expo and how it's evolved through the years. Very few of you will recall that the Expo came out of the first intense curricular design effort of the founding of the Olin faculty. Faculty were first recruited here to Olin in 2000, and by fall of 2001, under the leadership of our first provost, David Kearns, they unanimously developed the curricular bold goals before we had any curriculum at all. If you go back and review those, one of the bold goals stated this, the curriculum will include opportunities for students to perform before an audience that includes experts in the field of the presentation and performance. Another goal identified this, Olin College will strive to develop curricular opportunities for students to develop the ability to logically organize arguments and create persuasive vehicles of communication that convincingly communicates their vision. So these goals fit into what we then called the Olin Triangle uh, for the educational model. And it has three corners. At the top was superb engineering, and the other two corners were arts and entertainment, broadly defined. We thought of engineering then as a performing art, and the expo was the equivalent of a recital at a music school. Well, not surprisingly, Professor Diana Dabby was the author of the triangle model of our curriculum, which then became widely accepted. We explained that at the end of each semester, every student would be expected to stand and deliver to an audience something of their selection from their portfolio of project work. So by the time they graduate, each student would have had eight such performance experiences. I don't know of any other engineering school with anything which is so extensive and pervasive in the learning culture. Over the years, the Expo has evolved. It now emphasizes more celebration and inclusion and less assessment, but it has shaped our culture deeply and builds community in ways that are unique. And so while I, while I am sad that I cannot be with all of you in person today for this expo, I can see the results of all your hard work and I could not be more proud. So thank you and let's get on with the expo experience today. Thank you, Rick, for those kind words. Um, I think that all, the expo experience means something to every student here. And Expo certainly wouldn't be complete without a performance from Olin's um, Conductorless Orchestra. So to introduce the orchestra, we have Diana Dabby. Hello, everybody. Boy, it is great to be here with the Olin community. Um, I was asked to give some remarks on the Olin Conductorless Orchestra. 
And it's also known as OCO for short. Basically, the Olin Conductless Orchestra is the only conductless orchestra composed of engineers in the world. And the orchestra performs without a conductor. I am not sure I should say this, but there is not even a semiconductor. So um, we actually started in the fall of 2002, and we, the Olin Conductless Orchestra has grown so much since then. In fact, OCO just started and completed its 18th year, culminating in a concert for the third candidates weekend on March 6. At the time, we didn't realize it would be our last performance of the season. It got a standing ovation and something definitely crossed the footlights. That, and that crossing the footlights has actually happened at other OCO performances in the past. Just a year ago, the orchestra played a concert for the ASCE Zone One International Conference in Niagara Falls, New York, and it also brought an audience to its feet. So um, I just thought I'd move a little closer to Ola now and give, me, give you an interesting fact, and that is that OCO has played for every Candidates Weekend and every Fall and Spring Expo since inception. And you can imagine that when an email arrives out of the blue saying, hey, Diana, what's Expo without OCO? Well, the whole orchestra got together and came up with something that we think you enjoy. What you're about to hear is a video, a video that captures the last three years of the orchestra. And in this video, you'll also view and hear three short performance clips, all recorded live. Um, the clips will show you, and you'll probably go down memory lane a little bit um, with students, current students, current and past OCO students, and you'll recognize them. And I just have to say that each made an impact on this orchestra. And also, I would like to say that all of the scores, frankly, of Olin, um, Olin Conductless Orchestra alums over the last 18 years, uh, they, every single one of them, made a significant contribution to this orchestra. So we really thank you, one and all. And in fact, I believe personally, we could not have done this without all of you. So I also would like to thank the OCO Navigators for this year. They were so helpful for the entire school year. And they are Ani Tor and Shashank Swaminathan and Adi Sudakar. And actually, Adi designed and produced the video that you're just about to hear. And now for that video, recorded live from Olin College, it's the Olin Conductorless Orchestra.
Hey Olin community, thanks for listening to this video. We really appreciate all the support that everyone's given OCO over the years. We have so much love for everyone, students, staff, and faculty. You are what makes this community so amazing. Wishing you all good health and well-being. We can't wait to see you again soon. Thank you so much! Right now, we have a few minutes left before the presentations and all of the um, wonderful conversations start. We wanted to just thank everybody again for coming. It's been really wonderful to get everybody together. We have over 150 people on this Zoom call right now. And I definitely feel like the community is brought together much more by, by holding events like this. And I just want to take a minute to recognize all of the people who who came together to make this happen. So if everybody wants to turn on your video for a second and just give everybody a wave. Thank you all so much for coming. Expo wouldn't be what it is without all of you here to enjoy it with us. And to everybody who helped make Expo happen, Specifically, Alessandra, Susan, Allison, Jillian, John, President Miller, Diana, Anne Marie, and Rick Ostenberg, and all of the other story slammers. Thank you so much. And we hope that the rest of you enjoy Expo. Take care, be well, and have a great day.